Hello. Hey, it's Brian. How you doing, it's bro? It's me again. <laughs> hey. How was the canal? It's great, mate. I've been just fishing for some sticklebacks down there. Yeah. Did what did you do you remember do you remember the science show from last time? Yeah, man, I come in the shed, didn't I? I was just by the canal. <laughs> and I come in, uh and I'm here again. Did you like it last time? I loved it, it's mate. A, it's, I don't know if you remember, but it's a science podcast that comes out every two weeks. That was right. You told me that last yeah, time. Yeah, yeah no, the, it was good. So you're just a couple of blokes talking about some stuff to do with science. We, that, we tried to, yeah. Great. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, can I just put my sticklebacks in this jar <laughs> yeah, you, before I come in? You do that. I'll go oh. find Nick because he's a professor at South, Southampton University. Is he? Yeah. And, oh, I and didn't I'm know a that. Chemist at Cambridge University. And and we'll talk about your sticklebacks. How about that? Great, great. Looking forward to it, mate. <laughs> okay, right. Bunsen, Burner, Dolly, Machine, Internal, Combustion, Why Do We Need, Petri, Dishes, Oscar, Bay, Isaac, Newton, Transplanting. So Steve, is Carol Vorderman coming to the dinner tonight? Not that I'm aware, I couldn't see her on the form. So those of you listening will wonder why I've just asked that question about Carol Vorderman. Steve, tell us why I was looking forward to seeing yeah. Carol Vorderman tonight. Well, Nick has come all the way down from uh, from Southampton to Cambridge because I invited him to one of our college dinners. Um, and uh, I thought Carol Vorderman was coming because she's a former uh, alumnus of uh, Sydney, Sussex, which is where I'm a fellow. But she's not, so... So, I've just scanned the like guest list thing, and there's no Carol Vorderman. Not even the new one on Countdown now, who, to be honest, would be preferable to Carol Vorderman anyway. <laughs> no offence, Carol Vorderman. What's her name? The new I one? can't remember. Is it Susie? Uh, oh, no, Susie's the other woman. Susie Dent is the, the Dictionary Corner one, who I'd also quite like to see next You've got to. a bit of a thing for Susie, haven't I you? I quite like Susie, yeah. yeah. Well, she's <laughs> been there for years, and she was. she's got gradually more glamorous. I think if you plotted... Glamour against time, right? It would be linear. It would just go up gradually with a right. steady that, gradient. That kind of happened with Carol too, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, because when Countdown started, it was the first ever thing broadcast on Channel Four, um, and she was at the beginning. Well, she was a maths graduate from Cambridge, but she she got a not a very impressive degree. Uh, she got into broadcasting afterwards. This is Carol. Yeah, she's one of the Nines Club. The Nines. The nines. What's the, that mean? That means you get a third in every year of your degree. <laughs> no, poor Carol. Yeah. Anyway, in fact, I, I think if you if you Google on her Wikipedia page, I think it says she's part of the Nines Club. Oh uh, well, what, why, that just goes to show that yeah, academic absolutely doesn't doesn't success mean anything. isn't exactly. related. She's brilliant. I like Carol Vorderman actually. Um, I just prefer to sit next to the new countdown <laughs> one. <laughs> so yeah, uh, welcome Nick. Welcome back to to Cambridge and to and to my college. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm looking forward to dinner tonight. Um, I think that we've got. Uh, about seven courses on the menu, something like that. Yeah, we got uh, venison. Oh, great! Venison I like that. Wellington is the is the main course. That's oh, a weird bit of a mouthful. Venison Wellington. <laughs> yeah. It's like a tongue twister. Try saying that ten times. Venison Wellington. Exactly. <laughs> it's hard. It's like I'm not a pheasant plucker. I'm a pheasant plucker's son. Yeah, exactly. I'm not trying that one. Yeah. Um, well, but luckily enough, we can sneak in a little bit of podcasting before we before we uh, um, have to partake in the seven courses. Good stuff. So we're on good form at the moment. I feel great. Yeah. I went cycling this morning. I've come up on the train. I'm excited. I had a nice time on the train. All right. The other people on the train were interesting and exciting as well. Yeah. And um, I came into Cambridge and I caught the end of the Wales against Savants rugby match. That's yeah. ultimately disappointing for a Welshman such as myself. But never mind. But I feel good. And I think that we're going to crack on with a bunch of interesting little science nuggets tonight. I've got Shall some questions on with for it? you. I think so. But then tomorrow morning we can do... The flip side, ah, okay. the hungover. We've drunk so much port. That exactly. It'll be my so voice. Listeners... I reckon we could, we could analyse my so, voice. So the hang listeners on. now. Hang on. Yeah. We could analyse my voice, and I reckon it'll drop like, like an several semitones by tomorrow. <laughs> it'll be well, feeling rough. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like the listeners don't know they're about to. Hit, we're about to cut to ourselves being hungover tomorrow morning, <laughs> and but the, for the listeners, it will happen just right now. But but we're going to time travel. Wow. But at the moment, we should, should we just get on with talking yeah. about science? Yeah. Come on, Steve. <laughs> Drinking tea. <laughs> he's such such a consummate professional that we started podcasting. I like to and he's just, my tea. Mm. Steve, scientific bets. Scientific bets. Okay. So, do you know about any 
famous bets made in the history of science. Yeah, there was the famous one with um, uh, Stephen Hawking. We bet like a month's Playboy to the year. It was a year, a year subscription mm. to Playboy, right? There was whether the existence of black holes, whether the there was a black hole in the center of the Milky Way, wasn't that? I think that was the bet. I don't. I, I think it was specifically whether or not black holes Exist. existed or not. Okay. And he bet. He made that bet with. Do you know the guy who made it? He's no, called no. Kip Thorne. So he's yeah, another famous right, astrophysicist. Yeah. Um, it's only 1975, right? Which is a, yeah, which, which we, it goes to show how much we've learned, doesn't it? Because like, yeah, they, they, so there was a black hole called Cygnus X1, right? Which is also oh, a rush I, tube. I knew that was coming. <laughs> Cygnus X1, yeah. Right. So there was an album by Rush in 1977 called Farewell to Kings, which documents the story of a man <laughs> who flies a spaceship into the heart of a black hole. And who would have guessed this was like progressive rock? Who would like, yeah. Anyway, it's a great track. I urge you to check it out. Right. But anyway, they made the bet and um, ultimately Hawking conceded. He, he, he claimed did. he did it as kind of an insurance thing because he wanted it to be true. Well, he had a, I mean, Hawking radiation is what occurs at the well, he met, horizon. A, he of actually black had a, hole. Yeah, he had another bet later on on Hawking radiation. Oh, right. Okay. I wasn't going to talk about that because I didn't understand it at all. <laughs> but anyway, the black holes thing, whether they exist or not, was pretty clear. And yeah. he, he eventually, in 1988, he still hadn't decided whether or not he was going to concede. So 75, so he's 13 years in. After the bet, and still saying, mm, not really sure. Exactly, but now there's so much evidence you can see. I can't remember what year it was, but it was in right. the 90s at some point. Anyway, got me thinking about scientific uh -oh. bets. Well, there's lots of examples through history of other types of scientific bets. Right. So I had a little bit of a, a look around at wow, what this was is exciting. there. Yeah, so, so, so I guess in science you have this, um, you know, obviously there's kind of, com we don't know the answer, right? And there's people that are kind of competing views. And sometimes they do that vocally in the literature. Yeah. So sometimes you have, for instance, if two people have two ideas for a mechanism in biology or if they're looking for, um, I mean, famously it happens in um, uh, organic chemistry. They hate each other. They all yeah. just like, they like actively slag each other off in the papers saying, <laughs> Evans suggests this, however, this can't possibly be true, um, yeah, yeah. which is kind of interesting, like, you know, whether that, it always seems a little bit kind of caustic, but actually yeah. ultimately people have the same idea. I, I They're trying to get can... to the answer. So the whole Hawking, um, Kip Thorne bet was genial, right? Yeah. It was congenial. Yeah. They were, they were, Little two bumps. mates yeah. having a chat and the playboy was was what kip thorne wanted and yeah. private eye was what stephen hawking was, i didn't know that oh, but yeah. kip thorne won and he got his playboy for a year anyway. yeah but this goes back these types of bets go way back right so yeah. we're both fans of um alfred russell wallace we are absolutely he's the co-discoverer of evolution mm -hmm. okay often overlooked absolutely charles darwin discovered it before him, but hadn't published it. Indeed. So, anyway, he made a bet with a flat... So, Russell Wallace was actually a religious man. Mm. He I... was a devout Christian, but he bet a flat earther that the earth... He could prove that the earth was a sphere right. in 1870. That's cool. <laughs> they did an experiment. So, he bet him a lot of money. It's they 400 did... pounds, which is equivalent to several tens of thousands of pounds now. So, they so did who is an... this flat earther? Um... Yeah. Can't remember his name. Okay, doesn't really matter because he was some nutter flat earther in the eighties. Well, he must have been a rich flat, a rich nutter because he had four hundred. Never conceded it though. Ah, no, he didn't. Right. Well, Russell Wallace tried to prove it. He sort of got. It doesn't you know, really matter that much, but he he, he measured. There was a, a river in Norfolk, and basically yeah. the river's flat in a straight line for a long, long way. Yeah. So they hung a weight or a, a marker, a certain distance off the surface of the water, five kilometers apart, and he used telescopic sighting to prove that there was, it was an angle. It was dipping. There was an angle relative to now, the Greeks did this um, with sticks, didn't they? And and uh, if you know how far apart two sticks are and you can look at the angle that the shadow is cast, yeah. and then from that you can estimate the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. But anyway, they're fun, right? And there's, yeah. there's lots more examples I could talk about. But I came across a website. So my friend Andy... Do and I want to know about this, Nick? <laughs> Your kind of standard websites might be a Someone, bit... A friend of mine called Andy, he, he gave me a heads up about it. It's a website. Um, it's called Long Bets. Oh, Have right. you ever come across? No, this I haven't. It's no. great. Right. So on this website, are listed loads of long bets. So bets that people make about big ideas okay. that go into the future about big things, and, and they're so, generally low monetary value. So. Right, but it might be so. You, the, uh, the the I don't know the aquatic ape. Uh, will be proved the theory will be proved correct or something like that so that's a kind of slightly obscure one but yeah <laughs> I, I get what you're reasoning i mean the, the top one on the list that when i looked at it was driverless cars yeah driving the streets of las vegas by it's very specific as well weirdly by the 25th of may 2024 500 dollars. i'll take that you'll take it well someone did a guy called Stephen zoep took it so, so it was so, posed so, so, by a guy called jeff mccauley he works in sort of energy um, insurance. When, when was this? 
Um, the bet was made in quite recently, 2016. So it's a okay. new bet. I'd, I'd have a piece of that pie. Yeah, so it's, it's How much eight, was it? Eight-year bet, $500. $500. So like yeah, four, 400, 400 and something quid. Yeah, I've got, there's another good one on there. Yeah, go on in. The Large Hadron Collider Will Destroy the Earth. <laughs> That's a kind of a bit of a... <laughs> Fatuous comment there, isn't it? Well, I don't know. I mean, then there's, there's well, how sometimes would you claim, they go, how would you claim sometimes, it back? sometimes they go into very specific details. So with the large hadron so collider, nuts on there's it. small there's small print here, and I'll quote you what they say on this bet: the prediction is correct if Earth is, as a result of the operation of the collider, reduced to much smaller volume, vaporized, broken into large pieces, converted into radiation, <laughs> exotic smaller. matter, or makes- just unable to support life. So well, like if it got a little bit smaller, then they'd be like, oh, no, you don't, you can't, it's a, it's a loophole, it's you don't one. win the bet. Earth should be considered destroyed if, in 2018, zero human beings reside on the surface of the planet. But under- Te- tele- teleporting is excluded. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So there's, so, one, so there's another one, so like AI, AI running a corporation right. by 2108. 2108. You've got to live a long time to get that bet back. Yeah. Um, ex- ET stuff. There's all the usual stuff. ET exists. The yeah. Yeti exists by 2025. Um, 150 year lifespan. So there's loads of. That's really cool. Stuff, yeah, I it? think. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's. Well, uh, what I'm suggesting is I think that we, we should we pose a, each a bet. other a bet just for Ooh, fun. Okay. I, d- I don't think that you can automatically have one on a website. They get voted on and judged. All oh, right. So, so we should do it. It's to be reasonably um, interesting. But well, have a think. I, we're going to the dinner tonight, right? And there's loads. Of oh, interest- so this is my homework for tomorrow. Well, I, don't, I just thought we're going to the we're going to the Cambridge. Um, what's it called? It's a. It's just a, a dinner. It's a dinner at yeah. the college, Steve's College, and there's lots of interesting people in diff- working in different fields. Like well, I'm them. sitting next to a lawyer who's interested in Brexit and the cybersecurity guy. Yeah. So we might we might come up with some ideas. I've already got an idea for a bet. for a bet. How yeah. much? Like it's, they're just 50, they're just like a fifty fifty bet. I don't know. You're not giving odds at all. I think we we inventive with our prizes as well, like the Playboy thing. Yeah. Um, how about CRISPR? When will CRISPR be used on a human? Well, it already haven't they already got the go ahead to do that, and they've already got a license. For oh, that. really? Okay. Yeah, I think well, that's so. A, that's, that's, all right. that's a quite... <laughs> That'll definitely happen. <laughs> you t- I'll you bet should, on that. You should have shut up and taken the bet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's another one here. First interstellar mission. Before the 6th of December, 2025. What do you think about that? First, 2025. First interstellar mission. Sets off before 2025. 6th of December. Oh, I don't think that will happen. It was set by a dude who's competing for the X Prize. No, it won't happen. Not, not by 2025. So. I'll, I'll, um, I'd go against him on that one. Yeah, I think it's pretty optimistic. It's pretty anyway, good. let's think about it. And we'll, we'll come, come back to it. One. I'm and looking when forward I'm, to it. I've got when one. I'm really hungover tomorrow, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and pitch one to you. <laughs> good. <laughs> You're in love with Newton. I really am. It's my, my, my internal love letter to him. Do you fancy him? Um, I don't. No, not really. He's not an attractive looking character. He's got a, got a pretty powerful. And mind, they must have though. tried to make him look the best what's, that he possibly could. What's the could. word when the when you, like people are attracted to intelligence? Uh, uh, sapiosexual. That's what I mean. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Say people, again. Sapiosexual. Sapiosexual. Yeah. Oh, I see. Like sapien. Yeah. Sapient. I think yeah. Sapiosexual. So people like. Um, is that know. why I fancy Clarol Vorderman? It's why you've got hundreds and hundreds of like adoring fans, Nick, that are knocking at your door. I know it's a, it's but it's a problem sometimes. I just they just get in the way. I know. More than anything, not, don't it's they? Very difficult. Anyway, Newton. Mm. So uh, so last week on the podcast on episode twenty, we spoke about this letter I found from Isaac Newton explaining about. This colours. is when he tried to put his prism in another man's entrance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, and I wanted to come back to it a little bit. So. Um, uh, so for anyone, just a very brief recap. So uh, Isaac Newton wrote a letter about the kind of phenomenon of colour. 
uh, to the Royal Society in uh, seventeen seven no sixteen seventy one. Uh, and it's the kind of very famous experiment where he essentially looked, split light up and then recombined it. And I read it and I got really excited by it. And then Nick just like had to ruin it for me. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to come back to it because I wanted to talk about it a little bit more because it's great, right? So, um, so last time we left him, he just he just put a little pri- he put a prism on his windowsill and he was looking at the rainbow that comes out, right? Remember? Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's famous. East, I mean, the Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon. Yes. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. Way then, before Pink Floyd. But then Floyd. what he did... Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and um, everyone says they're a seminal band. But Newton was way ahead of them on that yeah, one. Yeah, way ahead Gee. of his time. Um, and then the other thing he did is he took the prism, uh, took an identical prism, and then put it next to the first prism to recombine the light. And here's, upside here's, down, isn't it? Here's the, here's the paragraph where if he If you look on it. the back of the gatefold of Dark Side of the Moon, yeah. there's another prism upside there is, down recombining yeah. it. Yeah. Um, uh, so he said, so, he, so, he, so he's talking about it, he says, and to try this, I took another prism like the former and so placed that the light passing through them both might be refracted contrary ways. And so by the latter returned it into the course from which the former had diverted it. And so it's kind of, that's the first time we've ever done that. Isn't that weird cool? Weird way of writing. It's a weird way of writing it, right? So anyway, he's, he carries on going and then he starts talking the bit which I thought you'd quite like, right? So Has he got like lots of booze and girls and things no, like that? <laughs> I know that is your main preoccupation, is is vice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't believe you're calling it vice, Steve, like you're stuck in the 1600s. <laughs> um, that is your main preoccupation. <laughs> Dr. Evans is vice. Exactly. Um, so th- here's his next bit. He's like thinking about light and colour. Hmm. He says, Then I began to suspect whether the rays, after their trajectories through the prism, did not move in curved lines. And... According to their more uh, less curvidity, tend to diverse parts of the wall. What right. the yeah, hell? It's confusing. You... Yeah. Like, like I agree, it's confusing, right? But um, he goes. When I remembered that I had often seen a tennis ball struck with an oblique racket, described such a curved line, for as a, as a circular as well as the progressive motion being communicated to it by the stroke. Hang on a minute, bend it like Beckham. Bend it like Beckham, exactly, yeah. It parts on the side where the motions conspire, must pref and beat the contiguous air more violently than the others, and there excite a reluctancy and violence and violency than the other, and there, uh, and and the reaction of the air proportionally greater. And then he starts talking about the lun, lun, the, the ether, so he's talking about how, how how tennis balls curve. Yeah. In relation. I mean, he's to just light. using an analogy and trying to apply it to light. It doesn't work for light, though. No, no. You can't hit light with a. You can't bash it with a prism, can you? He has a go. Does he? It doesn't What's work. He do? <laughs> so he goes. He did a load of wacky stuff, though. Yeah. He tried to stick a knife in the back of his eye to it, see whether that. Yeah, because he because he worked out that the image would be inverted in your eye, which it is. Did you know that? The image is inverted in your eye. Yeah, so yeah. the world is upside down. Yeah, your brain flips it And our brain it flips it the right way It's amazing cool, isn't it? Yeah, and a guy, the famous example of a guy who wore glasses right. that flipped the world upside down, and he kept them on continuously. And after about, I think it was something something quite short, like a week, it actually flipped the world the right way up again. And in his brain. So he visualised the world being the correct way up. When he yeah. took the glasses off, it went the wrong way again. That's amazing. It's totally weird. Yep. You know what? I can't believe that because... I'm going to have to look into you, you that. I, so I accept my physics teacher told me that at school, yeah. right? Yeah. And I believed it. But how is that possible? Did it happen gradually, or did it just one day it woke up? You and mean it was, the brain? How does your brain do it? In, what, how when, did it evolutionary, can't suddenly when, flip over? No, the, the idea here is that you wore the glasses, the world yeah. went upside down as it would. Yeah. But then your brain puts it the right way up. Yeah. So, so he was seeing the right way up. But yeah. did that happen suddenly? It can't oh, right. happen gradually. It's reckon, like all I, or nothing. I reckon it'd be like, yeah, you'd, you would suddenly, you'd look at something and... That and is weird. It's amazing, isn't We'll it? come back to that. We're yeah, so, so we do it. Um, uh, so I'm kind of involved with, one of the things I do is I talk about laser safety because our, our lab works with lasers. And there's actually a good example of when someone, if uh, someone damages their eye... Because you're a real safety conscious stickler for the rules, aren't you, I, Steve? I, you know how I always stick, stick to the rules. Safety first, Nicholas. <laughs> um, uh um, so, so, so there was a case where someone um, damaged the, they basically, uh, they got caught reflection from a laser and it damaged the back of their eye. Yeah. And it burnt a little bit of the retina. Right. 
But what they did is they kind of, they, it was a pulse laser, which has a very short... Uh, this very, was in your lab? No, no, this is in, this is in my lab. This oh, is gosh, a kind yeah. of case study. Imagine if that happened in yeah, your lab. No, no, we, we don't use pulse lasers, but, and, and we have uh, strict training protocols. Great, because um, they always work. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so what happened is, so this the, the guy's, because uh, he damaged his aqueous humor, it all went a bit red because it bled into his eye a little right, bit. Right, right. And then he, like, he, like... Um, uh, graphitized a bit at the back of his eye, right? Carbonized it. Yeah. And so what happens is it all drifted down slowly through his aqueous humus. He had like black bits. So the floating. aqueous, so, so just to correct yeah. your biology, yeah. so the aqueous humor is the bit in between the cornea and the vitreous humor. And oh, the, sorry, main, right, the main okay. body of your eye is the vitreous humor. Okay, in the okay. vitreous humor. Just, just, thank you. I appreciate correct, it. Yeah, we, you know, we're scientists <laughs> here, aren't we? Yeah, you don't mind. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Good, thank good, you for correcting that. Um, but, um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, and because uh, because it was drifting slowly through his eye, yeah. but like it, it, its brain was inverting it. For him, it drifted upwards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can yeah. do an experiment. I'll do it for you now. If you yeah. push this side of your eyeball, yeah. you'll see a black part appear on the other side. So if you just push that side of your eyeball, do you see a black yeah. object appear yeah, there? Yeah. That's because the image is inverted. And you're applying pressure yeah. to that side of your eye, but yeah. you're actually seeing it inverted. That's very cool. Do you know? Mm. You know? Because that's what Newton was brain... doing. He stuck a knife down the back of his eye. <laughs> Nut job. He also thought that when you ran quicker, it might brighten up things he saw. Because uh, he thought it was something to do with your light being like a ball or something. Oh, really? Yeah. So he thought that light was tiny little balls, cor- corpuscles. He called them. Yeah. So he thought if you ran towards a light bulb, it would get brighter because the balls would have more energy relative to you. I kind of I can see the philosophy yeah. there. So, yeah. but he didn't see that. He was he wrong. Could, he well, was. he did the experiment. And he, well, he and was it. wrong to start with. Light is a particle. Yeah, that's but... De Broglie famously coined Well, it's this, both, so. a bit of both, isn't it? Yeah. It goes both, but it's like well, bi. Well, well, everything is both all the time. It's just yeah, that the yeah. wavelength, your wavelength is very small because of Planck's constant. Absolutely. Um, we, all, we all bend both ways. <laughs> just the degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm not th- sleeping in your flat tonight, am I? No. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> your so, beard's looking very well. Uh, manicured today. Have you put oh, some gel on it? No, I haven't. I've done You've it. You've got exact beard opposite. stuff, haven't you? No, I do have beard stuff, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> just saying. I'm trying to talk about Isa <laughs> Newton here. And you just want to talk about my facial hair. Carry on. Um, yeah, so uh, he's talking about, he's, he's doing, he wanted to see whether it was straight or not, right? That the light was straight or not. And uh, hold on. What well, did he hit it with a tennis racket? He didn't. He like he was like basically he was trying to he was trying to put spin on a prism like so by he... bouncing it off a mirror. It didn't work. No. Um, but they said, but he, therefore he decided it must be in a straight line. And then he talks about uh, I want to talk something about that. You know, I told you about. Um... That's how you do stuff, though, isn't it? It's like you 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 have an idea and you test it as best you can, yeah. and then you rule things out. Probably, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong. It's just that you haven't got the best way of ruling it out. Exactly. So you have to work with what you've got. So after that, he does his experiment. Exper- uh, he does his, his crucial experiment. <laughs> experiment and crucius. And then after that, he figures out... A bit, that experiment tells him that light is composed of separate... Um, of, of, of uh, He doesn't know that at the time. He calls them rays of different refrangibility, but essentially yes. different wavelengths of light. Yes, right? different colours. Yeah, different colours. And then he goes this, you're like this. He goes, when I understood this... I left off my afore-laid glassworks, for I saw that the perfection of telescopes was hitherto limited, not so much for what the glasses truly figured according to the prescriptions of optics, authors, brackets, which all men have hitherto imagined, close brackets, uh, as because the light itself is a heterogeneous mixture of different refrangible rays. Oh. So he's kind of, it's interesting. That, so he's like, kind of worked out chromatic aberration. Yeah, so then he's saying, so... That chromatic the, aberration. What is chromatic aberration, Steve? Chromatic aberration. So, so because light is bent by glass in different amounts depending upon its color, what that means is when you try and when you imagine. So, it, we know that from going through a triangular prism. But if you imagine taking a piece of glass and shaping it into a lens, yeah, what that does is it focuses it to a point, yeah. Uh, and you can imagine if the light's bent by red light different to blue light, the yeah. point at which it's focused to is yeah. slightly different. It's all smeared out, basically. Well, it's not smeared out, but they're, they're, they're at different yeah. points. They're at different planes. But the colours, the image, the colours of the image are smeared. They're smeared because they're focused at different planes. Yeah. You're looking slightly in front or slightly behind. But it, it makes things blurry in yeah. different colours, basically. Yeah, right? it does. So, but so it kind of smears the colours out up and above where you're exactly. focused. Yeah, yeah, it depends on your nominal focal yeah. plane, they call it. Um, so I think it's just really cool because he's like the first time. So he's not just he's not just recognizing that this is true. He's actually you know thinking about the functional consequences of 
these uh, discoveries he's making. He's doing translational science. Exactly. Mm. Um, He'd probably get some money these days from (laughs) one of the funding councils because that's what they're obsessed with. That's true. Um, Well, in fact... No one wants to do sciences for the sake of it anymore, Steve. It has to have an application. Oh, Nick, don't be so... God damn it. So I'll, I'll finish on this, right, this bit, because it's really good, right? So he's getting all excited about light and stuff. And then he goes, and so he finishes the, uh, he's in the middle of a sentence where he's like talking about all these colours. And he says, so much a greater curiosity there would be requisite than in figuring glasses for refraction. Full stop. New paragraph. Amidst these thoughts, I was forced to, from Cambridge for the intervening plague. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I like the way he writes it into it. And it was for more than two years before I proceeded further. Oh, my God. I'm going to say that next time when I'm writing a paper when EastEnders comes on. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. Unfortunately, <laughs> my studies were curtailed in the cliffhanger episode. <laughs> By the intervening plague. It's good, isn't it? Nick. Mm. There's a couple of really important things coming up we need to tell the listeners about. Are there? Yeah. What? Well, first and foremost, the 12th of June. 2017. Right. What's happening then? That is the that is the first annual Science Shed Day. It's the anniversary. That's the anniversary of our first podcast. Oh wow, that's great! Is so, it going to be as popular as Ed Ball's Day? I I, I hope really so. Hope so. I really hope so. Mm. Um, and so I think we're uh, it's a Monday, so I've taken Monday? I'm going to take the Monday off. Wow. I think we should just go and um, we should organise a bit of a um, celebration. Steve, Steve, I've already got it in my calendar. Of course you do. Monday night. And you always get a better class of drinker out on a Monday, That's I true. find. Yeah. Only the proper ones. The None of the really... weekend part-timers. Exactly. Monday they're real, night drinkers. They've got committed. They're committed to boozing. We, we used to have a Monday night drinking thing we used to do when I was yeah. much, much younger. It was a six pints of Stella and no eating rule on a Monday night. <laughs> oh, my God. Once a year. It was terrible. <laughs> Long since been what, buried. I, t- I tell you what's good. Like, so Nick, Nick, and Nick introduced me to something. Like, there's very, f- there's a few things that I think like that's a really good idea that come out and that comes out of Nick's mouth. But one of the things he has, nice. I know. But one of the things you have is you told me about the lost day. Oh yeah. So I didn't. So, uh, so this year is a leap year. Yeah. So, t- t- so tell the it. listeners what the lost day is. Oh, well, me and some friends a while ago, leap year, 29th of February. You all know it's a yeah. day that only happens once every four years. So a long time ago, I can't remember where we were, it doesn't matter, but we decided that we went out for a a few drinks on the 29th of February, and then we said, well, every 29th of February we'll have a lost day. You just take the day Day off work, because it doesn't exist. Exactly. The day does not exist. It's it's not a day. So you take the day off work, and you go and you get... Um, you know, you drink a load of beers. Yeah, we did it I'm in San Francisco, didn't we? Days. Did we really? We, we had a lost day in I'd San Francisco. About that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we did we did. go? Oh, we just went drinking in the Castro, I think. Oh, was it one of those? <laughs> 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 anyway, yeah, my, so two of my friends did this year. I didn't join them. They went to Berlin. They for went a to lost Berlin day. for the day, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just spent the day wandering around Berlin. So, um, yeah, but we're going to have a science shed day. On the Absolutely, 12. and so I think the plan is we're going to get uh, we're going to sort it out so the listeners know, um, and we're just going to go in a pub and invite everyone that, if anyone wants to come and join us. So we'll be sitting by ourselves, Steve. Absolutely, <laughs> unequivocally. <laughs> happy to find by me. Maybe my mum will come. Or something. <laughs> Maybe you can invite Carol Vorderman. We should do that. I'll get yeah. her on speed dial. Yeah, um, you've got mates in high places these days. I wouldn't say brown that. nosing people at Cambridge. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the end. Yeah, it's a good here. thing to do it. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I look forward to that, Steve. What so, are we going to do? Just sit, sit in the bar. I think we should do that, and we should just invite anyone to come along, say hello to us, um, and see if they've enjoyed the podcast. Um, Sounds great. Let's do that. The other thing that's coming up is uh, on the 29th of March this year. There's the uh, Science Museum Lates, which so that's um, like the other soon. That's very soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we're my lab's doing it, so we're cool. we're, we're doing a our exhibition called How a Gin and Tonic Can Save Your Life. Um, and we're talking about um, instrument, uh, microscopy and uh, fluorescence. And we've got bubbles and UV lights everywhere. So it should Great. be pretty cool. Yeah. So um, it's free to come. Uh, you can just go to the uh, Science Museum in the evening and they open up. There's like bars there and things. Um, and there's lots of different uh, exhibitions. And so I've been to one before. My yeah. good friend uh, Mel um, works on nanotechnology. Yeah. She's not a science communication person. I went, she, she did a thing and i went and had a beer yeah well i think you know just want everyone should come down and say hello yeah um, definitely um so that's the other thing that's coming up but great we're looking forward to it can't wait <laughs> science shed. we're in the science shed science shed. we're in the science shed
Bunsen, Burner, Dolly, Sheen, Internal, Combustion, Why Do We Need, Petri, Oscar, Bay. Isaac, Newton, Transplanting. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go, Steve, another one. The end. Yeah, the end. we've come to the end of this special, um, well, it's not a special edition of a podcast, we really. should, it's a regular should, Commonwealth Garden what, one. We were just talking about this. What will be our next um, special, Science Shed special? Well, you were say, suggesting an Easter Easter special, but what? I don't know how that works. Yeah, I don't think we should do religious holidays. We should do scientific ones. Like a big bunny. It could be like pagan. You could just, pagan. All right, we can do pagan, pagan festivals. Bunny, <laughs> and we could do some, I don't know, like Wicker Man style fertility right. rituals. Okay, dancing around the Maypole or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. So um, to enhance my fertility. Yeah. Well. I, well. <laughs> what are you going to say, Steve? <laughs> anyway, no, yeah. Right. So. Um, yeah. So uh, if you like the Science Shed, please like, share, favorite, subscribe, all that social networking jazz. Please uh, do. I'm uh, Steve the Chemist. And I'm at the Evans Lab. And uh, if you also, if you want to do us a favor, what would be really good is if you could just rev- um, on iTunes or on SoundCloud, if you just write us a comment or uh, a review on iTunes, what that does is that gets the Science Shed up in the kind of iTunes rankings. It doesn't have to be a good one, but it'd be good to get some kind of uh, review. We need to be higher than we are. We, yeah. For, for, we're, we're planning for world domination, I think. Absolutely. And to do that, we need you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so please do that. And uh, we'll be back next time. See you soon, guys. Bye.